Okay, it's come to my attention that there's a lot of people out there who want to watch Thousand Year Blood War Arc, the final arc of Bleach. But a lot of these people who want to watch Thousand Year Blood War Arc don't want to watch the first part of Bleach. And by the first part of Bleach, I mean the first two thirds of Bleach. Because Thousand Year Blood War Arc is about 200 chapters, chapters 480 to 680, while the rest of Bleach is obviously those first 480 chapters. But if you want to watch Thousand Year Blood War Arc and you haven't seen or read the first 480 chapters, you are going to be so lost. As somebody who has read the manga cover to cover, even I get lost sometimes. Bleach is dense. And not in a bad way, it just has an incredibly fleshed out power system with a lot of really fake sounding words. And while we've technically done a video on spiritual power explained, that far from covers all the things you need to know before you start Thousand Year Blood War. So for those of you who want to see Thousand Year Blood War but haven't seen the rest of Bleach, this video's for you. But it's not only just for you, it's also for people who haven't consumed Bleach since 2014. Or possibly even before then. This video is to serve as a guide and or a refresher for those of you returning to Bleach for its final arc. But before we get to guiding or refreshing guys, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that notification. Oh God, where do we even start? There's a lot of things we need to cover. We need to talk about the races within Bleach, their certain powers, their motivations, who protects who, who attacks who, what hollows are, what the power systems are, how did we get to the Thousand Year Blood Arc? why are the Quincy's pissed? We have a lot of things to get into. So let's start this video the way that we tend to start these videos off, at the beginning. And while the beginning could be like hundreds of different places because technically the Bleach timeline is thousands of years old, we're going to focus on Ichigo because that's what Bleach focuses on. And as Ichigo encounters certain time periods being explained to him, I'll explain them to you. Ichigo was born to Ishin and Maisaki Kurosaki. He is the oldest of three children with two younger sisters. And he was born preternaturally strong. But he wasn't only born preternaturally strong, he was also born with a certain ability. An ability that allowed him to see pluses. Now what is a plus? Well a plus is essentially a benign human soul, a ghost. Now these ghosts come in two forms, those who still have their chain of fate attached and those who have had their chain of fate severed. Now a chain of fate is a chain that connects a ghost to its physical body. If a ghost still has its chain of fate connected to its physical body, that ghost can at some point return to its body and continue to be a human. However, should that chain of fate become severed, that plus can never return to their body and they are officially like dead dead. There's things that can reverse this, but we're not getting into that yet. Now, in order for a plus and or a soul to move on to canonical heaven, canonical heaven in Bleach is referred to as the Soul Society, a Shinigami, also known as a God of Death, also known as a Soul Reaper, has to come to the plus and perform something called a Kansu. A Kansu is basically just a ritual performed with the butt of a Shinigami's sword to send a plus to the Soul Society. But the problem is, after a plus has its chain of fate severed, that chain will slowly erode. And should that chain erode completely, the plus will become a hollow. A hollow is a plus and or a soul that has lost its heart because the chain of fate is connected to the heart of every soul. Hollows, for the large part, have no sentience. They are creatures of pure instinct. A hollow's heart erodes and becomes the mask that it wears on its face, which is why the only way to kill a hollow is to destroy its mask. The problem is Ichigo could see pluses so well he couldn't differentiate ghosts from humans, which is why when Ichigo was nine years old and he was walking home with his mother, he saw a girl on a bridge and he thought she was about to jump. Thinking she was a human, he ran to help her only to find out that when he got there, she was a ghost. But she was more than just a ghost, she was technically a lore. An intelligent hollow called the Grand Fisher used this ghost girl as a lore to pull people in. But before Ichigo could be snatched up into the Grand Fisher's trap, he was grabbed by his mother Masaki. And it's at that point that he went unconscious. And when he came to, his mother's dead body was on top of him. This flew Ichigo into a despair as he would often return to the riverbank where his mother died and look for her soul. A couple of years later, Ichigo enrolled in high school where he was often bullied or picked on for the weird color of his hair. This led him to getting into a lot of fights with thugs, which is actually where he met one of his closest friends, Chad, also known as Sada. Sada was a monstrously large high schooler with Latino blood, so people often picked fights with him because of the color of his skin or his size. And since they were both often pitted against thugs, they have each other's back in fights against thugs in the future. But that's enough backstory, let's get into Ichigo becoming a Shinigami. Oh wait, also Ichigo's father Ishin is a doctor, and one day an injured boy was brought to their clinic. Their clinic which exists in the bottom level of Ichigo 
Ichigo's house. However, the boy was incredibly injured, so all Ishin could do was call an ambulance, but the boy died before the ambulance got there. But the boy was brought there by his little sister, his little sister who would turn out to be Orihime. Orihime is also an incredibly important person to the plot line. She's widely considered best girl, and she's Ichigo's love interest. So thus far, we have Chad in Orihime. Now we can talk about Ichigo becoming a Shinigami. One night, Ichigo sees a bunch of skateboarders defiling the place of rest for a little girl. So Ichigo goes to shoo off the skateboarder so the little girl can rest in peace. However, as he's shooing off the skateboarders, he sees somebody in his bedroom. That person is Rukia, Rukia Kuchiki. Ichigo quickly realizes that he's the only person who can see Rukia in his house, and thus that leads him to believe that she's just a ghost. However, since Rukia sees that Ichigo can see her, she explains that she's a Shinigami, a soul reaper, the people responsible for killing hollows and performing Kansu on pluses. But Ichigo doesn't believe her and tells her to get out of his house. And it's at this point that Rukia binds Ichigo with a little thing called Kido. Kido is like soul reaper magic, and it falls into three classifications, Bakudo, Hado, and Kaido. Now I could do an entire video about Kido, but basically all you need to know about Bakudo, Hado, and Kaido is that they are binding destruction and healing spells, and that they're numbered, and that the higher number you use, the harder it is to pull off said Kido. So using Hado number three would be significantly easier than using Hado 93. Once again, I'll say Bakuto is binding, Hado is destruction, and Kaido is healing. So the Kido that Rukia uses on Ichigo binds him. So what kind of Kido was that? Bakudo. But after Rukia uses this Bakudo on Ichigo, a hollow breaks into their house. And upon hearing his little sister scream in fear, because mind you, they can't see the hollow, they just see their house exploding, Ichigo breaks the Bakudo with sheer strength alone. This impresses Rukia because it's almost impossible to do. But there's no time to be impressed, because the hollow has taken Ichigo's little sister as a captive, and Rukia needs help. So Rukia takes her Zanpakuto, which is the main weapon of a Shinigami and usually manifests as a blade, and pierces Ichigo with it to transfer half of her Shinigami power to Ichigo to make him a temporary Shinigami to help in the battle. Ichigo with his raw strength and this new additional power easily dispatches the Hollow. However, since Rukia gave half of her power to Ichigo, she can't return to the Soul Society. And since Rukia is in charge of protecting Karakura Town, where Ichigo lives, they now need a new Soul Reaper for that area. And since Rukia can't return to the Soul Society and the Soul Society thinks she's fine because she's still alive, they're not going to send any additional help to Karakura Town, and thus Ichigo has to pick up Rukia slack. So Ichigo and Rukia train for a little bit to make Ichigo a strong enough soul reaper that he can protect Karakura Town. Rukia moves into his closet, there's a whole training arc, and one of the first hollows Ichigo ever has to fight turns out to be a kid named Sora, or Hime's older brother. It's at this point that we find out that hollows tend to haunt their family members because hollows and pluses are tied to the earth by things they feel are left undone. And Sora, or Hime's older brother, wanted to protect Orihime. However, as a hollow, he was just basically haunting her. Ichigo and Sora's hollified form battled it out, until eventually Sora regains consciousness by biting Orihime when she jumps in front of Ichigo. And it's at that point that Sora allows himself to be purified using Ichigo's Zanpakuto. And since he was purified with the Zanpakuto, he gets to go to the Soul Society. Yay! Rukia then wipes Orihime's memory of the entire event like she did with Ichigo's little sister because Soul Reapers can do that, and Ichigo gets to go back to a somewhat normal life of a high school student. But here's the thing, not all Hollows get to go to the Soul Society. If a Hollow has been particularly evil in their Hollow life, or particularly evil in their human life, a Soul Reaper can send them to hell, which is... It's just what it sounds like. Oh, this is a good time to mention, by the way, that in order for Ichigo to fulfill the duties of a substitute Shinigami, his soul has to be separated from his body. Rukia, who's a soul reaper, can separate a soul from a body, and therefore she does that for Ichigo. But while Ichigo's body is separated from his soul, his body's just slumped. I'm bringing this up because Rukia acquires Ichigo a Gikon, which is like an artificial soul that takes the place of your soul in your body to make sure that nobody's suspicious of you while you're running around defeating hollows. It's like a placeholder. This placeholder soul is supposed to act like you, so nobody comes suspicious. However, Rukia didn't acquire a Gikon, she acquired a mod soul, which is a Gikon that's been modified to be stronger, smarter, or faster in certain areas. The problem is Ichigo's mod soul wants sentience, and also the mod soul wants to fight hollows. The only problem is the mod soul is fighting hollows in Ichigo's physical body. So after chasing down the mod soul, Ichigo gets the mod soul out of his body and he retakes over his body. They then put the mod soul in a stuffed 
I think he's a lion? And that mod soul is forever known as Cone. Is Cone the most important character in this show? Some will say yes. I'm probably gonna have to say no though. And now that Ichigo and Cone are friends, Cone gets to take over Ichigo's body every time he gets separated from it to go fight Hollows. Smash cut to a couple days down the line. Ichigo's woken up by one of his sisters. Today is the anniversary of his mother's death. And every year on the day of his mother's death, Ichigo and the rest of his family go up to her grave to pay respects. However, this year, Rukia decides to tag along, which is good because Ichigo detects the Ryatsu of a Hollow at his mother's great. Now, what is Ryatsu? Well, I have a whole video on it, but we'll go over it quickly. Ryatsu is also known as spiritual pressure, also known as the amount of Ryoku somebody is leaking out of their body. But what is Ryoku? Well, it's spiritual energy. Think chakra, mana, magic, any of those things. Ryoku is the lifeblood of a Shinigami, or a Hollow for that matter. It's what powers all abilities in the Bleach universe. Ryatsu is the pressure of somebody's Ryoku. That is to say, how intimidating their spiritual power might be. And after following this spiritual pressure, Ruki and Ichigo are faced with the Grand Fisher. Rukia reveals that Ichigo uses this spiritual little girl to lure out people with strong spiritual power so the Hollow can eat them. Because only people with strong spiritual power would be able to see the little girl lore considering she was made of Reishi, which is the structural component of all things pertaining to the Soul Society. You know how humans are carbon-based life forms? Well, Shinigami, Hollow, all of them, they're created with Reishi. And only Shinigamis and Hollows and those humans with high spiritual power can see things made of reishi but the thing is as ichigo and rukia go to attack the grand fisher the grand fisher changes the little girl into an image of ichigo's mother this is the grand fisher's ability it's called transcribe and because ichigo doesn't want to attack his mother he's stabbed through the chest and the grand fisher retreats rukia then uses Kaido, a type of Kido, to fix this wound in Ichigo's chest. And then there's a bunch of things that happen with a character called Don Kananji, who's essentially Bleach's Ghostbuster. And like, he can actually see ghosts and he makes a TV show about like haunted places and like exercising ghosts from areas. But he has no idea what he's doing, so he's just making the hollows worse. But basically from those couple of episodes, the most important thing we learn about is Jibi Kurai, also known as Earthbound Spirits. They're essentially human spirits that aren't able to go to the Soul Society because they have regrets tying them to the human world. A bad investment, a grudge, a family member, but basically all you need to know is Don Kanoji makes a couple of hollows really bad. Ichigo has to defeat them. It's kind of a long and arduous battle at a hospital. Nobody finds out that he's a soul reaper. Bing, bang, boom. But here's the thing. Don Kanoji isn't the only person who can see spirits outside of Ichigo and Rukia. Because Ichigo keeps running into the problem as he detects a new hollow they're dead before he even gets there. Which leads Ichigo to believe that there's another soul reaper in Karakura Town. However, this isn't the case. The other person who can see souls in Karakura Town is Oryu Ishida, also known as the last of the Quincy's. See, Quincy's also known as monks of destruction were humans that were able to see hollows and pluses. These humans use reishi in the atmosphere to manifest things like bows or swords to kill hollows. However, since Quincy's aren't soul reapers, they can't send the souls of hollows to either hell or the soul society. Quincy's simply destroy hollows. You see, this is a problem because if souls aren't leaving hollows and going to the soul society, there's an imbalance. Basically, the soul society and the human plane are a two-way highway. Souls go into the soul society and souls go out of the soul society. Souls go out of the soul society in the form of newborn humans, while souls return to the soul society in death. The problem is if hollows are completely destroyed, their souls are also completely destroyed, which means that souls would only enter the human plane, but not return to the soul society, which would lead to an imbalance of souls. And if the imbalance in souls becomes large enough, the soul society will begin to spill over, essentially making the soul society in the human plane one place. But the problem is that would also combine the life in death, because the soul society represents death while the human plane represents life. But if you combined life and death, both these worlds would collapse. And thus the Shinigami begs the Quincy's to stop killing hollows because you'll destroy the world. The Quincy's didn't listen, so the Shinigami killed all of them 200 years ago, which is why Oryu is one of the last ones. But because Oryu is a Quincy, he hates Ichigo because Ichigo is a Shinigami, the Shinigamis killed all the Quincy's. And because Oryu hates Ichigo, he wants to battle Ichigo. But the way he goes about the battle is a bit non-conventional. Basically, Oryu sets a bait trap that attracts a ton of hollows. And Oryu says to Ichigo, whoever defeats more hollows in 24 hours wins. The only problem is he dropped this bait in the middle of Karakura Town, so all of the hollows are probably going to kill a bunch of people. But obviously, attracting a ton of very powerful hollows breaks down eventually, and Oryu and Ichigo have to fight the hollows together. And it's at this point that Ichigo finds out that Oryu watched his sensei die. Essentially, Oryu and his sensei, who was his grandfather, were on the run from Shinigami their entire lives. And how even though Ishida's sensei, his grandfather, wanted to work with the Shinigami to fight the hollow, the Shinigami wouldn't work 
worked with him. And thus Ishida's grandfather was killed in front of him. And fighting off the Hollows is going relatively well until a Menos Grande shows up. You see, there's four different classifications for Hollows. Well, there's technically three. There's Gillians, Adjujas, and Vasto Lordes. And I'm gonna do a whole video on Hollows as well, but for the purpose of this video, all you need to know is Menos Grande is the weakest of the strongest types of hollows because Menos Grande fall into the Gillian class and it goes Gillian, Adjucas, Vastolordes in terms of strength. I said there was four different types of classification because technically everything under Gillian is its own classification but there's not a word for them and while technically they get the Menos Grande to turn around and then the day is saved, attracting all those hollows attracts the eye of the Soul Society who have found out that Rukia has transferred her powers to Ichigo which is not allowed. Soul Reapers not allowed to give their power to humans and thus the Soul Society sends a couple of lieutenants to get Rukia back and to kill the human who has received her powers. The person who was sent is Renji Abarai, a lieutenant of the 11th division of the Gote 13. You see, all Soul Reapers are split into 13 divisions, and all of these 13 divisions are led by a captain. The captains are the strongest people in the entirety of the Serate. The Serate is a place in the Soul Society where Shinigami aka Soul Reapers live. Lieutenants exist one step below the captain, and the 11th division is considered the strongest division amongst the Gote 13. But Renji isn't the only person who was sent and Byaki Akuchki was also sent. Byaki Akuchki is the captain of the 6th division and also Rukia's older brother. Renji and Byaki proceed to kick the ever-living shit out of Ichigo. So much so that Byaki actually thinks Ichigo is just gonna die and therefore feels no need to finish him off. And in this exchange, Byaki has actually cut parts of Ichigo's body that allow him to create Ryok. And thus by cutting these essentially vital organs, Ichigo was no longer a soul reaper. Ichigo then loses consciousness as Rukia is taken away. And it's at that point that he awakens in Urahara's shop. You see, Urahara is a former soul reaper and he now runs a shop in the human world where you can buy things that help you with soul stuff the geekon aka mod soul that rukia bought for ichigo it's at that point that uohara reveals to ichigo that rukia is going to be killed in 10 days for the crime of giving him power oh wait no it's a month and that if ichigo trains with uohara for 10 days he can give ichigo the power to go to the soul society and get rukia back but what does the training entail with uohara well essentially uohara takes ichigo to a large training area under his shop where they separate ichigo from his soul and sever his chain of fate however since they severed his chain of fate, that means that his chain is slowly encroaching. And if his chain of fate fully encroaches, that is, corrodes completely, Ichigo, like so many humans before him, will become a hollow. It's at that point that Urahara throws Ichigo into the bottom of a very steep pit and tells Ichigo he has 72 hours to climb out of that hole or he will turn into a hollow and they will kill him. However, Ichigo isn't able to get out of this hole in 72 hours. And thus, he begins the hollow fire. The thing is, though, usually a human's body will turn into a hollow and the last thing that will form will be the mask. However, Ichigo begins to form his mask first, which according to Urahara means he's resisting the transformation. And this forces Ichigo to get forced into a different plane of existence, at least mentally. And as Ichigo enters into this different mental plane of existence, he sees a man. And the man says his name, but Ichigo can't hear it. And this man basically tells Ichigo to suck it up, Buttercup, and use the reishi around him to form a Zanpakuto that can break this hollow mask and stop his hollification. So Ichigo figures that out, finds the hilt to a Zanpakuto, and then uses this broken sword to smash his hollified mask. But what does this mean? Ichigo just got severed from his chain of fate, and his chain of fate fully encroached, which means that Ichigo is now officially a Shinigami, and is technically no longer human. And since Ichigo is now a Shinigami, he jumps out of the shaft, and goes to fight Urahara, who he's upset with. It's at that point that Urahara reveals to Ichigo the next step in his training, knocking the hat off the top of his head. However, Ichigo is severely outclassed by Urahara, and it's at that point that Ichigo remembers what Renji said to him about his sword, his Zanpakuto. Renji, when he was kicking Ichigo's ass asked him if he knew his Zanpakuto's name. Ichigo had just seen Urahara call out the name of his Zanpakuto to create a Shikai. But what is a Shikai? Well, most Zanpakuto just look like a sword, right? If you know the name of your Zanpakuto, because all Zanpakuto are sentient, and you call the name of your Zanpakuto, it will undergo a Shikai or a transformation. This can make your sword a whip or a giant axe or two swords. So Ichigo, as he runs from Urahara, is once again teleported to that different mental plane where the man was. And it's at this point that it's revealed to Ichigo that that man is his son Pakuto and his name is Zangetsu. And as Ichigo calls out Zangetsu's name, it performs a Shikai, transforming into something incredibly powerful that knocks off Urahara's hat. And since Ichigo has now passed training, he gets to go to the Soul Society to rescue Rukia. But as he's going to the Soul Society, it's revealed to him that Sato, aka Chad, Ishida, and Orihime have all been training to follow him to the Soul Society because they are also friends with Rukia. And thus the four of them go through the Senkaimon, which is a portal between the Soul Society and the human plane of existence to save Rukia. Once they go through the Senkaimon, 
Paramon, they're in the Serate, the place that the Soul Reapers live. But none of the Soul Reapers want those four in the Serate, so a bunch of them come to fight Ichigo. And thus, Ichigo has to fight a bunch of Soul Reapers, of which he wins against all of them. Most specifically, he beats a man named Ikaku, who also serves as a high seat to the 11th Division. Eventually, Ichigo is able to take somebody by the name of Hanataro Captain. You see, Hanataro is part of the 4th Division, widely regarded as the weakest division. But they're not weak, they just kind of play a support role to the other divisions. However, Hanataro is a friend of Rukia and actually wants Ichigo to break Rukia out. And thus, Hanataro leads Ichigo to a shortcut to Rukia's cell. However, at the end of said shortcut, there's Renji, the dude who kicked Ichigo's ass a little while ago. But Ichigo defeats Renji using Getsuga Tensha, which is like Ichigo's Rasengan. It essentially allows him to shoot a big old blade of energy at his enemy. But Ichigo also uses something else outside of Getsuga Tensho to beat Renji, and that would be his Hollow Mask. You see, Ichigo technically holified, his chain of fate fully encroached. And while he technically should have holified, he stopped the process. But that doesn't mean he can't tap into becoming a Hollow. So Ichigo has the ability to put on a Hollow Mask that buffs all of his abilities by tapping into the power of Hollows. After recovering from his fight against Renji, Ichigo bumps into Kenpachi Zaraki, the captain of the 11th Division, the probably second strongest Shinigami in all of the Serate. The two of them fight to a standstill, that is to say they're both incapacitated after the fight is over. However, Ichigo is saved by a woman by the name of Yoroichi. And when Ichigo comes to, he finds that he's face to face with Byakuya, the man who helped Renji kick his ass and also Rukia's older brother. Ichigo wants to fight Byakuya, but Yoroichi knows he's not strong enough to do it, so she knocks him out and states to Byakuya that she will make him stronger than Byakuya in three days time. Boom! No Another training arc. Well, what's this training arc about? This training arc is about Bankais. You see, Zanpakuto's can do a lot of goofy, cute little things. If you know your Zanpakuto's name, you can use Shika. But you can go even further than Shikai by using Bankai. And Bankai is a unique ability to a Zanpakuto that's crazy powerful. Some people's Bankais make black rooms that if you get trapped in it, you lose all sense of sight, sound, touch, smell, all of that. Some people's Bankais summon giant samurais that mimic all of their moves. Ichigo's, which is known as Tensa Zengetsu, makes him fast and strong. And wouldn't you believe it? Ichigo figures out Bankai. And wouldn't you believe it? That Bankai is strong enough to beat Byaki Akuchiki. But while Ichigo is fighting Byaki Akuchiki, he's asking Byaki why he's trying to kill his own sister. And Byaki says, well, if you win this battle, I'll tell you. And the TLDR of it is basically Byaki once had a wife and she died. Because one time Byaki broke the law and he's never going to do that again. And because the Kuchiki household is one of the five noble families of the Serate, Byaki felt as though it was important for him to be the symbol of following the law and therefore therefore wasn't trying to let his personal feelings about Rukia dying get in the way of him being a symbol. And after Byakuya is done explaining himself, we find out that everything that's ever happened in Bleach has been orchestrated by a man by the name of Sosuke Aizen. See, Sosuke Aizen is the captain of the 5th Division. And technically, everybody thought he was dead, because when Ichigo and the rest invaded the Serate, they found his body impaled against the building. And thus, everybody thought that Ichigo had killed Sosuke Aizen. They were wrong. You see, Sosuke Aizen reveals to Ichigo and the rest of the Soul Reapers that he's orchestrated everything from Rukia giving her powers to Ichigo to Ichigo fighting Byaki in that current moment they had just fought in order to acquire something called the Hogyaku. Well, what is the Hogyaku and why did Aizen do this? Well, once again, could do an entire video on the Hogyaku. Basically, think of the Hogyaku like a genie. It is a small bluish purple orb made of reishi that is able to sense what the people around it want and make that a reality. So let's say I was holding the Hogyaku and it sensed that I wanted burritos. It would simply just create burritos. And only two of these have ever been made. One was made by Aizen, and the other was made by Urahara, the guy with the hat who runs a shop. The thing is, Urahara understood how powerful the Hogyoku was and wanted to hide it from everyone. And thus, Urahara actually implanted the Hogyoku into Rukia, and then essentially gave her something that would slowly but surely deplete all of her Shinigami powers and make her a regular human. And thus, his Hogyoku would live in a regular human, undetectable by anybody else. But Aizen knew about this, which is why he needed Rukia to transfer her powers to Ichigo, and then get brought back to the Soul Society where he could get his grubby little mitts on her. Ichigo then tries to attack Aizen, and once again, gets his absolute ass kicked. It's at this point that Aizen basically donut holes Rukia to pull out the Hogyoku, and then goes to a little Place called Hueco Mundo. Hueco Mundo is Spanish for Hollow World. It's the plane of existence where hollows live, and Aizen is the god of it. Oh, by the way, everybody's cool with Ichigo now, but because everyone was like, wow, Aizen's the real bad guy in all of this, everyone's cool with Ichigo, and they give him a little thing called the Substitute Shinigami Badge, which means even though he wasn't traditionally trained as a Shinigami and was actually a human to begin with, that they acknowledge him as a Shinigami and that he gets to go be a Shinigami up on the earth whenever they need him. And then there's 44 episodes of filler called The Bound Dark, which you should absolutely skip. After receiving his substitute badge, Ichigo goes back to the real world, 
But upon returning, he's confronted by a man by the name of Shinji. See, Shinji reveals to Ichigo that both he and Ichigo are visards. What's a visard? Visards are Shinigamis who have the powers of hollows. And they're called visards because they all have hollow masks. And then a couple of days later, two Iran car appear in Karakura Town. But what's in Iran car? Well, this whole arc is named after them, so you better find that out. An Iran car is a hollow, but a hollow that's removed its mask. Usually, these hollows start as Vasto Lordes, who are hollows with a level of sentience. And then Aizen finding these vast lordes or these very powerful hollows uses the Hogyoku, which allows you to blur the line between Shinigami and human to make them into more Shinigamis than they are hollows. See, by removing their mask by using the power of the Hogyoku, they've kind of become visors in that they have the human-like characteristics of a Shinigami, but also the powers of a hollow. The two Arankar that appear in Karakura Town are Yami and Okiora, who are Arankar number zero and four. Technically, as we understood it in this current moment, Yami he was only number 10, but he's actually number zero. Well, what do the numbers mean? Well, the Iran cars are numbered from zero all the way down to the hundreds in terms of strength. Actually, technically, only the top 10 Iran car are even considered Iran car. If you're under 10, you're kind of just a hollow. But when these two Arankar pull up, Ichigo pulls up to fight them, and he cuts off Yami's arm. Then when Uohara and Yoruichi get there to help Ichigo fight against these Iran cars, they pull out. And everybody gets to chill until a bunch of more Arankar come later that night. These Arankar are led by the number six Arankar, Grimjia. However, these Arankar are looking for humans with high spiritual power to devour, kind of like the Grand Fisher. And unfortunately, because Chad has a high level of spiritual power, these Arankar go looking for him. But Rukia steps up and uses her Shinigami form to fight against the Arankar that was looking for Chad, which is all well and good until she gets surprised attacked by Grimjiao and impaled. Ichigo then rushes in to fight Grimjiao, but quickly realizes he is entirely outmatched. And he's basically getting his teeth kicked down his throat until Konami Tosin comes out of nowhere and tells Grimjiao to head back to Hueco Mundo. But who's Konami Tosin? The Aizen wasn't the only captain who defected from the Saratek. There was two other captains that defected with Aizen, Jin and Konami. They are, in essence, Aizen's strongest subordinates. Ichigo, aggravated that he was losing the fight, understands that he needs to get strong. Longer. So he searches out that Shinji guy that he met earlier, one of his fellow visors. Because every time that Ichigo gets in a fight, there's a possibility that his inner hollow is going to break out of him and take control. And this loss of control is stopping Ichigo from achieving his pure potential. And then, boom, another training arc. Except this training arc isn't about Ichigo trying to fight the guy inside of his sword to get stronger. No, this training arc is about Ichigo fighting the hollow inside of him to get stronger. So Ichigo goes inside of himself, fights his hollow, wins, boom, now he can control his inner hollow. Only problem is, he can't control his inner hollow for long, so he's got to train with the visors in order to increase the amount of time he can control his inner hollow, aka the amount of time he can wear his visored mask. Because while Ichigo is wearing his visored mask, he has a big boost in abilities because he's tapping into the power of the hollows. Ichigo trains for a month and then he goes to fight Grim Jiao again. The only problem is Ichigo can only hold his visored mask for 11 seconds, but in those 11 seconds, he pushes Grim Jiao to his limits. But as he's about to deliver the killing blow, his mask crumbles and Grim Jiao wins the fight. And as Grim Jiao is about to deliver the killing blow, Shinji steps in and fights the Iran car off until the Iran car retreats. Small problem though, during that fight, Ichigo incurred a lot of damage. Damage that really only Orihime would be able to fix. You see, Orihime and Chad are kind of special. They're not Quincy, Shinigamis, or Visored. They're just humans. But they're humans with very high spiritual power and therefore they're able to use the reishi in the human world to manifest abilities of their own. Well, I guess technically Chad's a full bringer. I don't know if Orihime's a full bringer though. But we're not even close to that yet. Don't you worry about it. Regardless, Orihime basically has a hair clip that can split into a bunch of little spirits. And all of these spirits do different things. But one of these spirits heals you. But how does it heal you? Does it just suture close your wounds? No, this spirit has the control over fate and consequences. Let me explain this simply. If I stab you, the consequence of my action is a hole in your chest. But if you can rewrite the reality of fate and consequences and say, if I stab you, nothing happens, well, then you'll be healed. And that's how Orihime heals people. But that's like insanely powerful. So that's what the Iran car want. They want Orihime. And Orihime was actually the reason that Yami and Okiora went to Karakura Town. However, she's heavily protected. So Okiora visited her while she was alone and told her that if she went to Hueco Mundo, all of her friends wouldn't die. He then gave Orihime 24 hours to say her goodbyes. And these are the 24 hours that she used to heal Ichigo. Only problem is she couldn't tell anybody where she was going and why. So Orihime basically just defected with the Iran car to Hueco Mundo, at least that's what everybody at the Serate thought. But Ichigo was like, no, she wouldn't do that. I'm going to Hueco Mundo to save her. Boom, Hueco Mundo arc, worst arc in the show. And thus, I will move very fastly through it. Ichigo, Chad, and Oryu enter Hueco Mundo looking for Orihime. It's like the Soul Society arc, except without Orihime because 
you know, kidnapped. They're immediately attacked by two low-level Arankar, which Chad and Oryu elect to fight so Ichigo can keep going. But once they defeat the two Arankar, the building they were in collapses and they have to go outside. And this is where they see Las Noches, which just means the knights. By the way, there's like a lot of Spanish and bleach, which doesn't at all get confusing with all the Japanese and English. But once they get outside to Las Noches, they see a little girl by the name of Nell too. But she's being chased by Hollow, so they dispatch the Hollows that are chasing her and save her. And it's at that point that they find out that she's in Iran car. All three of them then have to defeat this massive sand hollow, but they can't do it. But luckily, Renji and Rukia can. Because, oh yeah, they're in Hueco Mundo as well. The group then breaks into the inside part of Las Noches, because Las Noches is a big desert with a really big castle inside of it that's basically a labyrinth. And then following the doctrine of Scooby-Doo, the gang decides to split up. But Nell decides to follow Ichigo. But Ichigo is soon attacked by a member of the Privion Espada. Oh, I'm sorry. Everybody is in Iran car. Only the top 10 are Espada. So like, regardless of your number, one to 200, you're in Iran car. But the top 10 are referred to as Espada. So what's the Privion Espada? Well, they're people that were Espada and now aren't. Basically, at some point, they were part of the top 10, then either they got weaker or Aizen just doesn't like them anymore. Ichigo then proceeds to just be like the worst for 30 episodes. Basically, he's fighting this incredibly strong ally and he's like, I'm not going to use my hollow mask. I need to save it for Aizen. And then he proceeds to get his teeth kicked down his throat for 30 episodes. And then after spitting out 18 molars, he's like, fine, okay, I'll use my mask. And then he uses his mask and he wins. While all of this is going on, everybody in the Scooby gang is fighting their own Iran car. Most importantly, Rukia is fighting one of the Espada. Specifically, a spot of number nine, whose name I'm not even gonna try to say. Eraniero, Eran, Eran, Aaron, Araniero, Aranio, Araniero. His name's Aaron, but Aaron and Rukia basically trade, meaning that Rukia like kind of dies. But here's the thing, Ichigo can sense her spiritual pressure and he senses that her spiritual pressure disappeared. And it's at this point of feeling her spiritual pressure disappear that Ichigo is confronted by Okiora. Ichigo then tries to go to Rukia because that's all he's concerned about in the moment. But eventually Okiora convinces Ichigo to fight him. And then donut holes him. Because Okiora is the fourth Espada, meaning that he is the fourth strongest Espada and way stronger than Ichigo. But it's at this point that Grim Jow finds the donut holds in very much almost dead Ichigo and then brings Orihime to heal Ichigo because he wants to fight Ichigo at full health. It's kind of like Goku throwing Cell a Setsu Bean. But this was a bad idea for Grim Jow because Ichigo kills him using the power of Orihime yelling. Basically, Ichigo and Grim Jow have this big, long, drawn out fight. And then as Ichigo is about to get struck down, Orihime is like, Don't die! And then he's like, bet, didn't think of that, and he kills Grimja. But after killing the sixth Espada, the fifth Espada pulls up, and his name is Gilga. But the problem is Ichigo got stabbed again by Grimja in their fight. So he's like really in no headspace to be fighting somebody even stronger than Grimja. But luckily for him, the little girl he saved earlier, Nell, actually used to be an Espada, specifically the third one. And her real name is Nelliel. But Nell loses. But Ichigo, enraged that Nell has been cut down, tries to go fight the fifth Espada, and then he loses. There's more people in Hueco Mundo. Kenpachi Zaraki, the captain of the 11th division that Ichigo defeated in the Soul Society arc, pulls up. And now he's fighting the fifth Espada. Mind you, like every other character at this current moment is also fighting other Espadas. Both Oryu and Chad had to defeat members of the Privion Espada. And Renji and Rukia and a bunch of other captains have had to fight actual members of the Espada. And all of them win their battles. Nobody from the Soul Society side dies and a bunch of Espada die. Number nine is killed by Rukia. Number eight is killed by Mayori Kuritsuchi, who's the captain of the 12th division, is basically a Rochimaru, has incredible science powers, is super dedicated to science, uses real life humans as experimentation. He's very evil, but at the same time, you kind of love him. Number seven is killed by Byaki Akuchiki. Number six was killed by Ichigo. Number five, Gilga, is killed by Kenpachi Zaraki. And after Kenpachi defeats Gilga, number five, Coyote Stark, number one, swoops in and steals Orihime back for Aizen. Because mind you, Orihime was brought to the battlefield by Grimjow without Aizen's approval. But Grimjow wanted Ichigo to be at full strength so we could defeat him at full strength. But as Ichigo, Renji, Chad, and Rukia go to chase after Orihime, they're stopped by Okiora, number four. Mind you, currently, Oryu is fighting Yami, number zero. Okiora wants to fight Ichigo, so a fight between Okiora and Ichigo starts. Ichigo dons his hollow mask and starts to get the upper hand against Okiora, but it's at that moment that Okiora releases his unpacked toe, Mersalaga. And then Ichigo does what Ichigo's best at, continues to get his teeth kicked down his throat. And then Okiora has a very classic moment where he tells Ichigo, this isn't even his final form, and then 
activates his final form. But what is in Arankar's ultimate form? Well, it's a little thing called Resurrection. In Valkyora, this Resurrection is called Segunda Etapa. Think of a Resurrection kind of as a Bankai for an Arankar's body. And upon using the second form, Okiora is so much stronger than Ichigo that he blows a hole in his chest using a Sera. What's a Sera? It's kind of like Keto for Hollow slash Arankar's. They're just concentrated blasts of energy. And a hole in your chest is not good for you. And this kind of kills Ichigo, like for the fourth time. But don't worry, Orihime's here to scream. And as Orihime tries to heal Ichigo, she yells at him to defeat Okiora. And it's at this point that Ichigo's inner hollow takes over his body and activates a new hollow form. A new hollow form that's so powerful it quickly defeats Okiora. Sort of. Okiora kind of just expends so much energy that he turns into dust and dies. After defeating Okiora and healing, Ichigo then goes to fight Yami, who's fighting against Oryu and Rukia. But as he comes onto the scene to fight against Yami, he realizes he can't use his hollow mask. But don't worry, because Byakuya and Kenpachi are there, and they kill Yami. Mind you, this entire time that Ichigo was in Hueco Mundo, there was a bunch of other stuff going on. But for you to understand that, I have to explain to you what Aizen's grand goal is. You see, the people that rule the Serate are basically the Soul Reapers. But at the same time, they're not. There is basically a Soul Society royal family, and nobody can really get to them. To get to them, you need a very powerful and very specific key. But there's really only one way to make this key. One, you need the Hogyoku. And two, you need an absolutely massive amount of souls. And therefore, to greatly simplify Aizen's plan, he wants to sacrifice the entirety of Karakura Town to create a key to get to the royal family to kill the royal family. Because he believes that the royal family of the Soul Society doesn't lead the Soul Society in the way that it should. However, the Soul Society most importantly, the Gotei 13 captains knew this is what he was trying to do. So they had Urahara make an entirely fake Karakura town and then replace the real Karakura town with the fake Karakura town and then move the real Karakura town to the Soul Society. They did this A, to make sure that Aizen wouldn't be able to sacrifice all of Karakura town, but B, because they knew Aizen would go to Karakura town and they wanted to minimize the casualties the fighting there was going to cause. So the entire time that Ichigo is fighting Okiora, the Gotei 13 captains and a bunch of their lieutenants are fighting the highest ranking Espada. They're also fighting Aizen, Tosen, and Jin. Is it Jin or Gin? I think it's Gin. So they're fighting people like the third, the second, and the first Aron car, but not Zero Yami because he's fighting against Kenpachi and Byakia in Hueco Mundo. And there's a bunch of battles between captains and high-level Espada. And it always looks like the captains are about to lose, and then they win. But this is mostly because the captains who are actually relatively outmatched are actually saved by the Visors. The Visors are the group of people that are led by Shinji, the people who are like Ichigo, who have the powers of both Shinigami and Hollows. They pull up in the battle against the Espada to help the Gotei 13. But here's the thing, the Visors and the Captains don't really like each other. This is because we find out that the Visors actually used to be a part of the Gotei 13. Some were Captains, some were Lieutenants, but all of them were betrayed by Aizen, who actually experimented on them to make them Visors. And because the Gotei 13 thought that they were Hollows, they tried to eradicate them, but they were saved in the human world by Urahara. So the power of the Gotei 13 and the Visors combined leads to the defeat of all of the Espada. And Kaname Tosa one of the captains who defected with Aizen. Which just leaves Aizen. Great news! Except it's not. Because Aizen Zanpakuto has a funny little ability. Basically, if you've ever seen his Shikai, that is to say, if you've ever seen his sword transform, you are under his control, basically. What does that mean? Basically, if you've ever seen Aizen Shikai, he can control whatever you see and sense. That is to say, he can cast you into a genjutsu of sorts. He can make illusions around you that you believe to be real. And thus, as all the captains and visors try to attack Aizen, Aizen, they all kind of come up short. In fact, Aizen goes so far as to make a bunch of the Visors in Gotei 13 impale one of their own thinking that she is him. Aizen also goes on to defeat Captain Yamato, the captain of all of the captains of the Gotei 13, the strongest Shinigami in existence. But the reason that none of those people there can defeat Aizen is because they've all seen his Shikai released. You know who hasn't seen his Shikai released? The main character of the story, Ichigo. And Ichigo is currently on his way from Heiko Mundo with Captain Unahana, one of the captains of the Gotei 13, specifically the captain of the fourth division. You know, that support division. Unahana is an incredibly powerful fighter, but she's also a fantastic healer. And as Ichigo appears in the Soul Society, he tries to cut down Aizen in one strike, which Aizen blocks with a barrier. And it's actually not until after Ichigo launches an attack that all of the other Shinigami and Visors step up to fight Aizen, including Captain Yamato, and then subsequently get their ass kicked. But here's the thing, fighting against all of these people did actually injure Aizen, but that's not really a problem for Aizen. Why is that not a problem for Aizen? Because he has implanted the Hogyoku in his chest. Remember how the Hogyoku who used to be in Rukia's chest? Well, yeah, now it's in his. And it's at this point that Aizen tells us that he once thought the Hogaku only had the ability to blur the line between hollow and human. But he realized as he spent more time with the Hogyoku that it actually just made whatever you desire 
real. And since it was in his chest and since he was injured, it healed him because he wanted to be healed. So now you have the strongest captain in existence with a genie in his chest with unlimited wishes. And the only person left to fight him is Ichigo. Everybody else has been taken out. Or is he the only person? Because as Aizen is sitting there healing himself with the power of chest magic, he's telling Ichigo about how basically everything in his life was from Aizen's doing and how Aizen has manipulated him from the shadows his entire life in order to make the perfect test subject. But as this is slowly but surely casting Ichigo into despair, Aizen is interrupted by Ishii. Who's Ishin? Ichigo's dad. Yeah. He's a Shinigami too. But not only is he a Shinigami, he's one of the strongest ones ever. And that's actually why Ichigo is so strong because he is the son of a Shinigami and a human. Ishin then removes Ichigo from the situation and says, if you have any questions, I'll answer them later. To which Ichigo says he doesn't have any. But Ishin wasn't the only person there. Uohara and Yoroichi are also there because they're always there. And they go and battle Aizen, who is slowly but surely getting even more powerful with the power of the Hogyuku, which is slowly assimilating itself into his body. But while they're off fighting Aizen, Ichigo is fighting Gin, one of the captains who defected with Aizen. But as Ichigo is fighting against Gin, he doesn't feel as though Gin's heart is in his sword. That is to say, he feels as though Gin is pulling his attacks. But that doesn't change anything because Ichigo does what Ichigo does best, gets his ass kicked. And as Gin is about to finish off Ichigo, Aizen stops him. And it's at this point that they open a Senkaimon to the Soul Society where the real Karakura town is located. But Ichigo, after losing to Gin, who isn't nearly as strong as Aizen, gets really despondent. Especially as he stares upon Urahara, Yoroichi, and Ishin, who have all been defeated by Aizen. But Ishin gets up and tells Ichigo to open a Senkaimon of his own to go protect the real Karakura town. Remember, a Senkaimon is a hallway between different dimensions. But if you enter a Senkaimon, you enter a place called the Dongai. Think of it like this. The Senkaimon are the doors to the hallway, while the Dongai is the hallway itself. Within the Dongai, time based basically doesn't move. I believe it's one hour in the Don Guy equals 3,000 hours in the other dimensions. But usually you couldn't spend 3,000 hours in the Don Guy because there's a big old vacuum monster that will kill you to keep you out of there. However, because Aizen had fully fused with the Hogyoku and was feeling super cocky, he killed the big old vacuum monster. The big old vacuum monster is called the Kotetsu. So when Ichigo and Ishin enter the Don Guy, they decide to do another training arc. So when Ishin and Ichigo enter the Don Guy, Ishin tells Ichigo that he can give him three months to learn the the final Getsuga Tensho. Getsuga Tensho. There's so many hard words. So, another training arc. But what's this training arc? Well, it's Ichigo going into his sword again. Basically, Ichigo has to get Zen Getsu to tell him about the final Getsuga Tensho. But this time, when Ichigo enters his sword, he's confronted by his Bankai, Tensa Zen Getsu. But Tensa Zen Getsu tells Ichigo that he can't teach him the final Getsuga Tensho, which confuses Ichigo because he wants to save the people of Karakura Town, but Tensa Zen Getsu wants to protect something else. But Ichigo doesn't know what Tensa Zen Getsu who wants to protect. During this fight, Ichigo has to confront the true source of his despair, his inner hollow, which he thought he defeated a while ago. And once he decides to confront his despair, Tensa Zen Getsu and his inner hollow combined to fight Ichigo as one. But it's when they combine that Ichigo realizes that what they want to protect is Ichigo. So Ichigo throws away his sword and lets the combined being impale him. And this combined spirit starts to cry and tell Ichigo that he finally figured it out, that all they wanted to protect was him. This is because if he uses the final Getsuga Tensho, he will lose all of his Shinigami powers, aka he will lose them. But since Ichigo has now made this revolutionary revelation, he has access to the final Getsuga Tensho, and he bids the two beings farewell. Mind you, in this hour or three months, if you were in the Dongai that Ichigo was training, Aizen would have destroyed Karakura Town to make the key. However, Gin wasn't actually evil. And in fact, Gin had been a double agent for Aizen this entire time, because Aizen hurt his childhood love, who also grew up to be a lieutenant in the Gote 13. So while Aizen wasn't looking, Gin impales him with his Bankai, and he impales him through the Hogyoku, which Gin and a couple of other people are able to keep away from Aizen until Ichigo is done. After Ichigo is done, though, he steps out of the Senkaima. Aizen isn't impressed with Ichigo, though. In fact, Aizen can't sense any spiritual pressure from Ichigo at all, which leads Aizen, which leads Aizen to believe that Ichigo actually converted all of his spiritual power into physical strength. However, this isn't the situation. See, the way that spiritual pressure works is that if you're close to each other in spiritual pressure, you can ascertain how much spiritual power somebody has by reading their spiritual pressure. However, if somebody completely outclasses you in terms of spiritual power and therefore spiritual pressure, 
you can't even sense their spiritual pressure. And that was the case for Aizen and Ichigo. But Aizen didn't know this, so he rushed in to attack Ichigo. Ichigo then proceeds to basically dog walk Aizen, until Aizen is so weakened that the Hogyoku begins to reject him. And as the Hogyoku begins to reject him, Aizen reverts back to a regular human, a regular human that Urahara binds. Aizen is then sent to the Soul Society for his punishment to be decided by the Central 46, who are essentially like the Senate of the Soul Society. Oh, by the way, Aizen killed the Central 46 before he betrayed the Soul Society. He then had everybody under his spell and acted as the Central 46 to make sure that some laws got passed that he wanted. But the new Central 46 sentenced him to 20,000 years of prison. After the battle, Ichigo passes out for a month. When he wakes up in his room, everybody he loves is around him, including Rukia. However, since Ichigo has lost all of his Shinigami powers, Rukia is basically saying goodbye. So they say goodbye to each other, and that's it. Until the Fullbringer arc, also known as the Lost Substitute Shinigami arc. 17 months after defeating Aizen, Ichigo is just a regular old high school student. But he's so sad about not having his powers. But if Ichigo's not watching Karakura Town, who is? Or you or Hime and Chad. It's like the Soul Society arc, except without Ichigo. Aruki is not around because she's no longer assigned to Karakura Town. One day, as Ichigo is on his way home from school, he stops a thief who stole a man's bag. He returns the bag to the owner, whose name is Kujo Ginjo. Ginjo thanks him for getting his backpack and asks if he wants ramen. Ichigo says no and not to tell anybody about this because he doesn't want anybody knowing that he hurt a guy. Because he doesn't want anybody trying to get revenge against him. This doesn't work though because apparently the guy Ichigo beat up was a member of a gang, and the gang comes to find Ichigo at school the next day. Ichigo and Oryo beat all of them up. After this, Ichigo goes to his part-time job, an odd job service. However, when Ichigo gets to his job, Kujo shows up, the guy whose bag he got, and asks if Ichigo will do an odd job for him. The odd job is looking into Ishin, Ichigo's father. This makes Ichigo angry, saying that he'll answer any questions about his father that Kujo has. But Kujo asks if he has enough information about his own father to answer those questions. Kujo then tells Ichigo to go to Urahara's shop, calling Urahara a shady character. Meanwhile, Oryu is out trying to hunt for hollows. But as he's out trying to hunt for hollows, he sees a man sitting on top of a telephone pole. As Oryu goes to follow this man, the man turns around and cuts down Oryu. Oryu is then found and transported to the hospital where Ichigo and Orihime visit him. Ichigo, frustrated that there was nothing he could do to help Oryu, calls the number that was given to him by Kujo, and Kujo and Ichigo decide to meet. But before they meet, Orihime asks Ichigo if she's seen Chad around because he's been missing for a couple of days. Ichigo says he hasn't seen Chad and goes to meet with Kujo. When Ichigo finally meets with Kujo, he asks Kujo to help him find whoever hurt his friend, because Ichigo figures he's not a regular human. It's at this point that Kujo introduces Ichigo to the rest of his crew, a group of Fullbringers who want to transfer their abilities to Ichigo. But what is a Fullbringer? Why do they want to give their abilities to Ichigo, and how does that work? Well, the Fullbringers explain to Ichigo that everything, not just humans, has a soul. These headphones have a soul. And if I have a close enough connection with these headphones, I can tap into the soul of these headphones. And if I can tap into the soul of something, I can change its shape. I could make these headphones tiny, really big. I could make these headphones dead. I can make these headphones a snake that wraps around my enemies' necks. Fullbringers use this ability to tap into the souls of things they're familiar with, and then they use those items to fight. As Kujo and the rest are explaining this to Ichigo, Chad enters the room. Apparently, Chad is a Fullbringer, which is why he's been missing for a couple of days. His Fullbring abilities depends on the soul of his skin, his dark skin that he's very proud of that was passed down to him by his grandfather. Chad uses the pride in his skin to tap into the soul of his skin to use his abilities, which essentially make one of his arms a very powerful attacking machine and one of his arms arms a very powerful shield. The Fullbringers go on to explain that they don't like having these abilities, and that the only way for them to get rid of these abilities is to hand off these abilities to a substitute Shinigami, and thus the Fullbringers want Ichigo to get his Shinigami powers back, so they can transfer their abilities to him and live a regular life, which means Ichigo's gotta get his Shinigami abilities back, which means it's time for a training arc. Except in this training arc, Ichigo's not going inside of himself or a sword, no, he's going inside of a dollhouse. Ichigo gets shrunk and put in a dollhouse where he has to fight a Yakuza member who's been stuffed into a plushy bear. One of the Fullbringers, if she likes something, can change its shape. But she likes a lot of things, so she can control a lot of things. And one of those things she likes is Ichigo. And the only way that Ichigo will be able to defeat said Yakuza bear is tapping into the Fullbringer ability. Because the only way for Ichigo to get his Shinigami abilities back, according to the Fullbringers, is to learn Fullbringing abilities. But the only thing that Ichigo has on him that he has a close enough connection to in order to use as a Fullbringer ability is his substitute Shinigami badge, which he makes into a Manji. Ichigo then uses this Fullbringer ability to defeat Mr. Pork. And after defeating Mr. Pork, Ichigo is released from the dollhouse, and him and Chad are heading home. However, as they're heading home, they realize something is wrong with Orihime's Ryatsu, for spiritual pressure. See, Orihime, while she was alone, was attacked by somebody, and this person released a bookmark into a Zanpakuto. And Orihime was stabbed by this person, but no physical wound was left. This confused Orihime, but before she could even make sense of it, Chad and Ichigo showed up. Orihime, who didn't want to worry Ichigo, because as far as she knew, he didn't have any abilities anymore, decided 
decided to not tell them anything in the moment and decided she would text Chad whenever Ichigo wasn't around. Ichigo realizes that Orihime and Chad are keeping things from him, so he goes back to Kujo. He explains the situation to Kujo, and Kujo explains who the person who most likely attacked Orihime is. His name was Shukuro Tsukushima, and he was the old leader of the Fullbringers, who, by the way, as a group go as execution, but it starts with an X, so it's edgy. But apparently, it was his idea to get a substitute Shinigami to give all of their abilities to. But when they found the substitute Shinigami, and a couple of the Fullbringers gave their abilities to said Shinigami, Tsukushima cut down the Shinigami and the Fullbringers who gave over their abilities. And Kujo believes that Tsukushima is attacking the people close to Ichigo, most likely to keep Kujo and Ichigo far away from each other. So Ichigo can't take the abilities of the Fullbringers. The next day, Ichigo was sealed inside of a fish tank. And this time, instead of fighting a plushie, he has to fight one of the Fullbringers. But as Ichigo is about to defeat this Fullbringer, his Fullbringer ability starts to take over his body. And before Jackie, the Fullbringer who was in the fish tank with him, can stop him, Tsukushima actually comes to the execution headquarters and cuts the fish tank in half. Chad rushes in to protect Ichigo from Tsukushima, but Chad gets stabbed. But just like with Orihime, he doesn't feel any physical wound. And as Ichigo flies in to attack Tsukushima, Kujo tells him that he can't let Ichigo fight Tsukushima yet, because Tsukushima is too far of Ichigo in power. So Kujo and Tsukushima begin their battle. And in order to make sure that Ichigo wouldn't go try to fight Tsukushima, one of the other Fullbringers seals Ichigo. He seals Ichigo within a video game, because his Fullbring ability revolves around video games. Kujo eventually battles off Tsukushima, and Yukio, Kujo, and Ichigo eventually go to a new hideout of execution, where Ichigo has to go through his final test, being sealed in the video game of Yukio's while fighting Kujo. And what time is it? Another training arc time. Ichigo can't beat Kujo for a long time. Kujo's beating Ichigo so soundly, he actually cuts out Ichigo's eyes. Kujo, despondent over the fact that Ichigo wasn't making any progress in his Fullbringer abilities, tells Ichigo that if he doesn't get it together, he'll kill Orihime, who got brought into the video game by Yukio to heal Ichigo whenever he got hurt by Kujo. And as Kujo goes over to Orihime to kill her, Ichigo flies into a rage, finally figuring out his full break. And upon mastering his full break, he fires against a Gatencho at Kujo, which almost kills Kujo. Kujo then congratulates Ichigo for figuring it out. Everybody is then released from Yukio's video game. Having mastered his full break, Ichigo then heads home. Only problem is when he gets home, Tsukushima is sitting on his couch. This freaks Ichigo out, but everybody that he knows is there. All of his friends, his family, Orihime, Chad, and they're all claiming to know Tsukushima. They're all claiming that Tsukushima has been a lifelong friend, and this freaks Ichigo out. He then begins a fight against Tsukushima, but the thing is, everybody is taking Tsukushima's side. Orihime, Chad, the rest of execution is all taking Tsukushima side, claiming that Ichigo is acting erratically and they're helping Tsukushima in his fight against Ichigo. And thus Ichigo is having to fight against Orihime and Chad and people that just trained him. This is when Kujo appears and explains to Ichigo that all of them have fell for Tsukushima's trap. See, Tsukushima's Zanpakuto doesn't cut the human body. It cuts history. So if Tsukushima cuts you, he can control your memories, meaning he can insert himself anywhere in your life. And thus he had cut every single person in Ichigo's life and inserted himself into their lives, making every person around Ichigo believe that Tsukushima is a childhood beloved friend. Tsukushima, Kujo, and Ichigo eventually end up fighting at Tsukushima's mansion. And as Ichigo fully activates his full brink, he cuts off Tsukushima's left arm. However, it's at this point that Chad breaks down a wall and begins to fight Ichigo. And Orihime uses her healing abilities to heal him. Tsukushima, that is. And as Ichigo is distracted by fighting Chad, Tsukushima gets behind Ichigo and goes to stab him. But Kujo takes the stab for him. Ichigo rushes to Kujo's side and asks if he's okay. And Kujo says that he's fine and he doesn't believe that he's been affected by the Book of the End, which is Tsukushima's Zanpakuto ability, the one to put himself in memories. He tells Ichigo that he still thinks of Tsukushima as an enemy and Ichigo as a friend. But as Ichigo turns to fight Tsukushima, Kujo stabs him through the back. This is when it's revealed to Ichigo that Kujo technically had always been on Tsukushima's side, and that the second cut actually hadn't changed Kujo's mind. See, Kujo and Tsukushima wanted to steal Ichigo's Fullbring ability, but they knew if Ichigo was onto them even a little bit, he wouldn't be able to fully awaken his Fullbring abilities around people he didn't trust. So Kujo, who's actually the leader of Tsukushima, had Tsukushima cut him in the beginning and alter Kujo's memories to believe Tsukushima was evil. But the way that Tsukushima his abilities work is that if you receive a second cut from him, it gets rid of the memories he altered. So the cut that Kujo had taken for Ichigo simply made Kujo remember that he was Tsukushima's boss. It's at this point that Kujo reveals that he was actually the person who cut down Oryu. And as Kujo pulls his sword out of Ichigo's chest, Ichigo's full brain goes with the sword. Having gotten what they wanted and Ichigo now being powerless, Tsukushima and Kujo retreat. And as they retreat, they tell Ichigo to thank them for sparing him. But after those two leave, Ichigo is stabbed 
again. But this time he's stabbed by Rukia. But this time it's a good stab. See, Rukia stabbed Ichigo with a sword that was imbued with the spiritual power of all the senior officers of the Gote 13. You see, essentially the Gote 13 heard Ichigo wanted his spiritual power back. So every single captain and lieutenant and high ranking officer imbued their spiritual power into a sword that Rukia stabbed into Ichigo. See, apparently Ichigo hadn't technically lost all of his spiritual power. It had just gone into dormancy. And by being stabbed by so much spiritual power from such high ranking officials, he awoke to all of his spiritual power again, making a full circle to the time that Rukia stabbed him with a sword imbued with her power to make him a substitute Shinigami. Except this time, it was the entirety of the Gote 13 making this heinous act. But the Gote 13 was indebted to Ichigo because he defeated Aizen. And now that Ichigo had all his power back, he chased after Kujo. But Kujo's not alone. He has all of the other Fullbringers on his side, which means it's Kujo, Tsukushima, and I think like three or four other Fullbringers. How is Ichigo gonna fight all these people on his own? Great question. He won't. Guess who's here? Kenpachi Zoraki and Byaki Yakuchiki, as well as Ikaku Renji and Toshiro Hitsugaya, who is the captain of the 10th Division. And all of them proceed to kill the Fullbringers they're up against. Except for Rukia. Rukia loses. It's a trend. All of their battles take place in little video game dimensions, because Yukio, one of the Fullbringers, puts every single one of them in a little video game dimension. And the only way to get out of said video game dimension is for one of them to die. But luckily, Captain Hitsugaya comes into a battle against Yukio and freezes him and says if he doesn't release all the video game dimensions in five minutes, he'll kill him. So Rukia, without dying, gets released from said video game dimension. Snap back to Ichigo against Kujo. Kujo reveals to Ichigo that Kujo was the first ever substitute Shinigami. And Kujo says that his battle is against the Soul Society because the substitute Shinigami badge is actually kind of evil. See, apparently the substitute Shinigami badge doesn't just give you authority to fight hollows as a human. It actually suppresses the power power of the Substitute Shinigami and tracks them so that the Soul Society can keep an eye on them because they don't trust Substitute Shinigami. Kujo believes telling this to Ichigo will get him to turn to his side. But Ichigo, who just got his powers given back to him by all of the highest members of the Gote 13, doesn't really give a shit. Completely forgot Oryu is also in there fighting against Kujo with Ichigo. Oryu is the last Quincy. The fight between Kujo and Ichigo doesn't go great. Because Kujo had taken Ichigo's full brain, Kujo had all of Ichigo's abilities. However, the knockoff is never as good as the original. And when Kujo Kujo's Bankai meets Ichigo's Bankai, Kujo's sword snaps, and Kujo receives a fatal wound. Kujo's body is then brought to the Soul Society, but Ichigo goes to the Soul Society because he wants to bury Kujo in the human plane. He wants Kujo's body because Kujo was a substitute Shinigami, and he believes, even though he was misled, he deserves to be buried on Earth. Oh, and technically most of the Fullbringers didn't die, and they all had somewhat tragic backstories, but they're all reformed now, and they're living a better life. And that is Bleach. Could I have gone more into certain things? Absolutely. Are we already probably around an hour and 20 minutes? Also, absolutely. I will at some point make a more in-depth dive into Bleach as a whole. We will do you know nothings about each and every single character in Bleach. We didn't even talk about the fact that in the Soul Society arc, Oryu Ishida used all of the rage he could possibly ever muster and lost his Quincy abilities only to get it back because his father shot him in a specific place. This was more a look into Bleach through Ichigo's eyes. And wow, there is many. Many things I could have gone into and made a six and a half hour long video. This is to serve as a short summation of Bleach for those of you who have already seen it or for those of you who don't want to watch it so you can enjoy Thousand Year Blood War arc. If you want deeper looks into Bleach that aren't a huge summation with generalizations, go ahead and like the video, subscribe to the page, and hit the noti bell because they'll be coming eventually. Or if you want me to explain anything from Bleach or from this video in deeper detail, tell me in the comments below. Is this video 930 clips long? Absolutely. If it doesn't blow up, I'll lose my mind.